The Unshackled Waves, episode 232. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. An issue that's been of concern in Australian politics for some time is that of foreign interference, mainly from the Chinese government. The ABC's Four Corners program recently aired its third episode on the topic, introducing two new Chinese businessmen who have been attempting to influence our political class on behalf of Beijing. But the rise of China is a wider geopolitical phenomenon, with the nation and its communist government wanting to expand its influence and power in the wider Asia-Pacific region. To give us an overview of the Chinese overall activity and goals is my guest David Lee, who runs Australia's only YouTube channel dedicated to geopolitics. One of his goals is to warn Australians about the danger the Chinese government's influence poses to our standard of living as we know it. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, Australia and China are becoming more intertwined, uh, not just uh, geographically, as Australia is considered uh, part of Asia, and it's always talked about we're in the the Asian uh, century, but there's a big Chinese uh, presence uh, in Australia uh, because of um, immigration over the past 50 years. In the 2016 census, uh, 5.6% of Australians had uh, Chinese ethnic heritage, Ten percent of Sydney's population had Chinese background. Uh, Eight point five percent in Melbourne, and there's uh, big Chinese hubs in in Sydney, such as in Hurstville and and Chatswood. Uh, so there certainly is uh, what people call a, a melting pot uh, happening uh, in Australia, and especially in our two major cities. Well, yeah, of course. So we are a small population with a large land mass and we have about 25 million people. We're surrounded by 3 billion people um, from developing countries and we've had such a high standard of living for the last decade. We've arguably been had the highest standard of living um, in the world. And so therefore, a lot of people from uh, a multitude of demographics would be wanting to try and get in here, of course, you know, and and we've had the privilege and the leverage of being able to select the best, uh, mostly, mostly choosing the, the best. Um, but, but when you say Chinese, uh, there is a difference between, say, North Chinese, South Chinese, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, and, and there's also Chinese people who are pro-Chinese Communist Party and Chinese people that just don't want anything to do with it and they want to get away. That's why they came to Australia in the first place. So I guess the first thing I want to, would like to start with is that there's a huge difference between uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people. And, and I think all Australians need to be aware of this. Um, the last thing we need to do is uh, be painting them all with the same brush. Uh, we do have a rising China on our doorstep and their, their plan is to become the Asian hegemon, um, which spells uh, big changes for us. Um, but we still need to be aware that uh, the, the Chinese people are our best weapon against the Chinese Communist Party. And, um, and if we start painting them all with the same brush, we're going to lose one of our most valuable tools against this oppress oppressive regime. Yeah, you're not anti-Chinese <laughs> people. Um, you could argue that some Australians, when they, they do uh, spout um, anti-China anti arguments, they, they do have a prejudice against Chinese people, but that's not what we're talking about. They're, their government is a totalitarian one-party system, and the fact that it has one billion people over at their disposal, that's that should scare anybody. Yeah, of course. It's, well, uh, Emperor Xi Jinping, he's an emperor. Um, he's, he, uh, even Donald Trump recently, uh, in, in a private conversation, and said that uh, you're king, aren't you, Xi Jinping? And Xi Jinping said, uh, just chuckled about that. 
and that was uh, Donald Trump having a little bit of a shot at his uh, dictatorship that he's uh, developed over there. Uh, and, and you see, uh, we do have, there's only really one Chinese media in Australia. I'd like to bring it up now. It's the Epoch Times. And uh, at the top right of their paper, they mention 330. I think that's the, the tally. They tally it up. Uh, with every newspaper, 330 million Chinese who have left the Chinese Communist Party. So they're actually tallying it. I don't know how they gather that data, uh, but they, they're operating in, in Australia and Western countries. Um, and that's 330 million people that are on our side and the side of democracy, the, the side of freedom, uh, the, the, the side of uh, capitalism and everything good in the world. and freedom of speech uh, and everything that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't stand for. Now, even though Australia-Chinese relations have deteriorated over the, the past year with a lot of concern over Chinese Communist Party foreign interference, there's been quite a, a cosy relationship for the past uh, 10 years. There's been uh, $60 billion worth of Australian exports going to to China, and then there's been $40 billion worth of imports, uh, this is per year, uh, uh, coming from uh, China. There was a free trade agreement signed in, in 2015. If you go to look at Australia's consumer goods, they, they all say made in China, the vast majority of them. And obviously one of our greatest exports in Australia is education. There's a lot of uh, Chinese students attending our schools, uh, universities. Our education system likes uh, having those students because they're, they're full fee paying and brings in a lot of revenue. Yeah, of course. I guess when you look at the international system, there's no real police. There's no real, uh, th there's no one you can turn to if something goes wrong. And uh, Australia is kind of isolated. We're, we're a long way from everybody else. So we're difficult to invade and we have the protection of the United States. China has no choice but to pay what we, we ask. If they want something from us, our resources, they have to pay full fare. And uh, that's because we have the protection of the United States. If the United States left, all they would have to do would be set up military bases around us and pressure us to sell our resources as, at a cheaper rate. We have a lot in common with uh, Venezuela. Venezuela is in the Asian uh, under the the umbrella of the uh, the American hegemon, and and so America does not tolerate peer competitors, especially in their region. And they see we we have the benefit of being able to call nine one one, call the United States, or uh, if we have any troubles in our region, and. Um, uh, if China was to become the Asian hegemon, we would not have the benefit of calling the United States and we would have to uh, sell our resources at whatever fee the, the Chinese ask because it all comes down to leverage. Well, we're certainly enjoying selling our, our minerals. We're one of the most uh, resource-rich nations in the world. There certainly doesn't appear any coercion at this stage, but even though we're not using much of our, our own minerals here, but that's a whole other political debate, we certainly love sending it over to, to China and getting, getting money for it. Yeah, of course. Uh, see, the, the international system is effectively anarchy. It is not necessarily, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, it's not necessarily a, uh, a rules-based uh, world we live in. Uh, you have to have leverage uh, in, in any negotiations internationally. And when China negotiates with us, uh, we have big brother, the United States, uh, always as like a intermediary the, the entire time. So that's why they are forced to pay what we ask. 
for instance, if you look at uh, Iran, Iran's oil is going quite cheap at the moment, the same as Venezuela's oil. Now, the reason I've got you on uh, this week is because uh, ABC Four Corners, they've done, it's now their third uh, program on uh, Chinese influence on our our politics. They, they focus on what is called the, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which appears to be a network of, of business uh, people who are designed to, to get cozy to our, our politicians, uh, donate money in the hope of influencing things to, to Beijing's uh, favour. Oh, you mean the, the Chinese People's Prom uh, Promotion Party? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, well. Uh, yes, yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I guess the, the best way to look at it is what America does and, and how America plays countries and the political system and they, they try to instill, uh, get rid of, <clears throat> sorry, get rid of dictators and put leaders in that are pro-America. It's the same, it's the same play that uh, China is doing right now. As China grows and becomes more wealthy, uh, their economy grows, they are going to want, they're, they're going to demand more respect and more influence. That's just how it works. And uh, at the moment, and for the, the entire time as Australia's since 1788, uh, we've always had Britain was the maritime power. And then, it's, uh, and then shortly after that, uh, after World War II, the United States became the maritime power in Asia. And then we switched allegiances to uh, America. And uh, now we're looking towards a possible Chinese hegemon. And well, we are going to see a lot of changes. And unfortunately that that might ne not necessarily be the type of changes that we want uh, and it might it might affect our economy in ways that we we don't necessarily like one of the the business people who's been in the in the spotlight in australia is uh hung uh Jengmo. he uh donated a lot of money to our political parties and uh there was the the infamous uh press conference that sam destiari gave where he changed his uh party's policy on the on the south south china sea which uh, led to his uh, resignation from politics now he's uh not just been refused citizenship but he's been uh banned from uh, Australia. Now, the, the Four Corners uh, episode had introduced a, a few other um, Chinese businessmen who sought to gain political influence. There was uh, Tommy Jiang, who is a, a media mogul in Australia of Chinese media, uh, but he wants these media outlets to have pro-Chinese Communist Party messages and there was the story of one radio host who was eventually sacked uh, because he let too many critical callers through and you mentioned the the, the epoch uh, times as being one of the the few media outlets chinese media outlets in, in australia who who don't toe the line there was another one that was mentioned in the program the vision china uh, times that uh, newspaper was uh, refused uh, sponsorship of the georges river lunar new year uh, festival because of basically a few emails from the the chinese consulate in sydney even though the you would think that the chinese people living in australia they Australia and the, the Chinese Communist Party, they still care a lot about what information is fed to them and what their perceptions are of the, the, the Chinese government back in People's Republic of China. Yeah, I guess so. That's why there's a lot of Chinese, uh, Chinese language media in Australia. Uh, Scott Morrison and uh, a lot of the Labour Party members have, and David uh, Coleman as well, they've all been on a lot of Chinese media. Uh, I see it all the time. You, you guys might not necessarily follow um, any of the Chinese media, but they're always appearing, they're always turning up at meetings. Uh, just because uh, this has only recently been exposed on Australian 24-hour uh, news uh, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a new thing. It's been happening uh, since the early, say, since since John Howard was in power. Uh, it's been a very common thing, and, and and that's that's part of the the amount of money that China has. They they want influence. They want power. They want leverage over this country, and, and that's not going to stop. But you see, if we part of the problem here is that if we start watching the news and just singling out one little see there's going to be uh, a multitude of problems coming and and the the overarching problem is the chinese communist party and if we just keep focusing on each little problem like this we're going to get lost into uh, the small little things and losing picture of the the big picture which is that uh, things are changing and that a lot of it is out of our control. Uh, watching the news and feeling that we can discuss these things, uh, if China keeps growing the way it does, we are not really going to have uh, a say in the future. There's not really much that we can do, unfortunately. Yeah, I think you're right that we've only begun to talk about it in the Australian uh, political media because of these recent programs. Uh, and when you do watch these programs, you're surprised at how many of these Chinese events our politicians are attending. And then you see the, the photos of uh, all, all of the politicians at these Chinese events, and then you're really exposed to, wow, our political class, they do a lot of catering to uh, get money and get votes from the the Chinese uh, community here and of course we saw what happened to the uh, lab state Labor opposition leader Michael Daly when he was talking about uh, Australians uh, being replaced in our cities with Asians with PhDs that was seen as the main reason he lost the uh, election and why he's been now shuffled out of the leadership yeah well yeah of course that's um we live in a multicultural country and some people are more sensitive than others it's not necessarily the type of argument or type of things that politicians can get away with these days yeah but it just shows you sort of the our political class they're they're aware of the the power and the the need to engage this community in the australian political process well the the australian i'd say the the australian people say the with the british background or the anglo-saxon background they're not as politically active as say people from asia that's just a fact they might not they might only be five percent of the population or uh, or a little bit more but they're far more politically active they're far more and that that it might come across as being a lot more sensitive, but that type of, uh, if, if you don't like what a politician says and you're politically active and you take a stand, you, you get what you want more. And, and the Australian attitude of, oh, she'll be right, mate, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily helping us politically either. We're losing our voice because of it, because Australians just let things go too easy. And uh, if you if you talk up and you uh, you Australians will often say, oh, it's a conspiracy theory or it's a paranoia. If you start talking about, say, China or uh, influence in our uh, politics, only recently people have started to wake up a little bit and start to actually start talking about this and say, maybe this isn't necessarily uh, the future that we want. But you see, we haven't seen any of the real negative effects of this global hegemon, this behemoth on our doorstep yet. We haven't really seen any of the real negative effects. And I guess that's what I would like to talk about is the fact that we are such a resource rich country. Uh, we, we, um, we, we have a agriculture, uh, we, we produce a lot of food that is very valuable we have a lot of farmland that's very valuable a lot of resources and uh we have there's a lot of mouths to feed just north of us and if they can use their leverage uh politically or militarily they will to to take what they can from us 
Well, that's certainly what I aim to do with the Unshackled is to, to wake Australians up to what's really happening. And yeah, it's it's been She'll Be Right, Mate, for, for way too long. And I think that that's changing. But let's uh, move away from Australia and uh, look at uh, China as a, as a global uh, player. And you mentioned that uh, uh, Jiang Juping, he's made himself uh, president for, for life, uh, which is confused a lot of people who just thought well he's, he was a dictator anyway he's he, but he's just made himself that he can be a dictator for longer than somebody else yeah well he, he's effectively an emperor now he's, he's, a, he's an emperor uh he'll be there for life uh, i don't see any difference between that uh, a dictator emperor same type of thing one of the arguments that i often hear is uh china has never invaded anyone China's a Confucius, uh, Confucian country, peaceful country. Um, and uh, I'd like to try and argue that they're not. When you look at the countries that surround China, how many countries are really scared of China right now? And uh, I guess uh, Vietnam is one country which, are, which really sticks out to me. There was a huge war, the Vietnam War, where America caused a lot of trouble. Millions of people died. Now, if you look at uh, the Vietnamese people, the Vietnamese government now, they're in bed with the United States. Why? Because they're so scared of China. Yeah, it's amazing how and things it, have changed in 40 years. Yeah, yet, yet we, have, we have China who... Uh, remembers uh, the hundred years of humiliation, the Opium Wars, and they, they hold a huge grudge against not only the British people, but the French, the Japanese, the Americans. Uh, the, the, the latest, one of the biggest wars that we've had in modern history is the Vietnam War, and they're in bed with the United States already. They've dropped, they, they've forgotten about, well, they haven't forgotten about it, but they have no choice but to get in bed with the United States because they fear this soon-to-be Asian hegemon rising. And, and if you look at Taiwan, Taiwan's scared. They're really scared. Taiwan, uh, only, recently, uh, only, only recently, they uh, China flew fighter jets over the top of Taiwan just to let them know that we can invade you at any time. Uh, South Korea is, is getting closer and closer to China every day and when you look at all the countries that surround china name one that has benefited from china the only reason why australia has benefited is because we have we can call 911 we've got the united states to look after us and we have leverage in negotiations but uh, look at mongolia they're, they're poor they're so poor you you, you go you go um uh, you look at north korea it's a basket case not one of China's neighbors have benefited from China's rise. And uh, when I go on WeChat, I, I've, re I've found on WeChat that you can buy slaves in North Korea on WeChat. Wow. You can, buy, you, you can hire a Chinese man to go and kidnap a woman in Vietnam for you. Like, this is not a joke. I can show you screenshots. Yeah, that's uh, it's a good is, point that is, you make. This is this is the country that we're dealing with, and Australia's uh, GDP per capita is what forty six thousand dollars. It might be down to forty five now. <laughs> we're slowly uh, decreasing, but China is about seven thousand. Their GDP per capita is seven thousand, and people say there's one point three billion Chinese, but there's, uh, they don't mention the undocumented Chinese. And if you go to China and you go to the rural areas, you realize that there's people that have lived their entire life and they've never been documented. The real, the real population is more like 1.5, 1.7 billion people. So the GDP per capita is a lot lower than what people are reporting. And that, that's, that's why China arguably wants to have a cashless society so that they can track their enormous population. And if you've got that many mouths to feed, you need to expand. 
you you get to a point where you have no choice but to expand and there's a lot of agriculture down in australia and there's a lot of resources and the only reason why we have leverage in negotiations is because we're best buddies with the still global hegemon the united states but how long that's going to last i don't know well, one of the potential uh, battlegrounds in the Asia Pacific region is the South China Sea, uh, which uh, China they they're staking a claim to a lot of the the islands there, the Spratly Islands, and talk, uh, one of the strategic partners they're looking at is the the Philippines under uh, Duterte. They're trying to turn him into an agent. Of China, why is control of the the South China Sea so important, and could it disrupt uh, global trade if they gain more control there? Well, let me answer. Well, I like to call it the East Philippine Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, has the United States ever threatened uh, China's maritime trade routes? No. They have not. And so for the, all those people out there that say that China is uh, going to rise peacefully, well, they're already proven that they are not going to rise peacefully. And this, the, uh, the, East, the, the, the West Vietnam Sea or the, the East Philippine Sea or the South China Sea, whatever you want to call it, that is a mistake that the Chinese Communist Party made. If they hadn't have done that, uh, we would never know their intentions. Uh, it is a red flag to the rest of the world. And that's why, uh, the, well, look at the Philippines, they're, they're poor. They don't really have much choice in the matter because when Xi Jinping put the thumb on them and they started to not necessarily do what the Chinese Communist Party wanted, straight away, a whole shipment of uh, tons of Philippines uh, bananas landed on the docks uh, in China and they were left on the docks to rot. And, and that's how they use geoeconomic uh, leverage against the countries around there. And then, you know, they went back in the negotiations. They, 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 they didn't allow Philippines trade through as soon as they, and, and you can't really blame the Philippines for switching sides. They don't have a choice. And also the Philippines is very important too because the Philippines is part of the first line of containment. So the Philippines connects with Taiwan and Taiwan connects with Japan. This is part of the United States uh, first line of containment for the Chinese. And when we look at this, uh, we call it containment, but the Chinese, they see this as aggression. You see, or you can only look at uh, capabilities. You you can never really uh, you can never really know what the intentions of another state is. So as soon as China starts growing and they they build a little bit a bigger military, we instantly start to see that as aggression. And if you have a look at uh, Asia, the consensus is real. They all believe that China is a threat. And that's why if you look at, say, Japan and India, these guys are best buddies now. But geographically, they couldn't be further apart. Why? Because they fear China. Uh, despite uh, China with, with all these ambitions, it hasn't been able to cannibalize uh, Taiwan. It considers Taiwan uh, part of the People's Republic of, of China. And for uh, those who want to know a bit of history, uh, Taiwan is where the, the nationalists, um, when they lost the Civil War, they fled to Taiwan, and that is known as the Republic of, of China. Hong Kong was a, a British outpost that's now a special administrative region of China and they've they've managed to uh, get a stranglehold in in Tibet uh, free Tibet it's, it's it used to be one of the favorite slogans of Hollywood uh, virtue signalers but uh, and obviously the the Dalai Lama is there uh, in, in exile um, so th there's these other parts of China which they they want to 
stamp their authority over? Yeah, I think it was 50 BC. Uh, Taiwan was part of the Han. Uh, so, so Taiwan and a small part of China was the, the beginning of China. So they do have a good argument there, but you see, <coughs> sorry, the, the, the real government of China is the government that fled to Taiwan. And you see, that was the government that was fighting against the Japanese. And while that government was fighting the Japanese, Chairman Mao uh, cowardly built a military and started fighting his own people. You see, so that government was trying to fight Japan and then they ended up having to fight uh, Chairman Mao's uh, People's, uh, People's Liberation Army. And uh, at the end of that, they had to flee to Taiwan. So still to today, uh, we can argue that they're the rightful leaders of uh, the entire China. And well, after Chairman Mao took over, 40 million people died in the liberation of China. And then another 60 million people died of starvation. starvation. Now, a lot of people talk about Hitler and uh, World War II, but it pales in comparison to the 100 million people that died after this evil prick Mao. Now, this Chinese Communist Party is still in power in this country. So uh, if you look at the way that they treat their own people, Imagine how they're going to treat the rest of us when uh, the United States is pushed out of Asia forever. Yeah, true. China, it hasn't just uh, tried to, to influence the, the nations in its uh, region. It's also uh, tried to uh, get uh, nations on side in, in Africa with a lot of development funds to, to get a lot of the, the resources there. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, when you look at the, uh, the Australian people uh, a long time ago, we used, to, uh, we used to be adventurers. We used to pride ourselves on, uh, you know, Douglas Mawson hitting Antarctica and, and uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, you know, you know climbing mountains. And, uh, but you see, we've lost that adventurous spirit. And that adventurous spirit is very much alive in China right now. There's a lot of Chinese businessmen that are that are starting up companies and businesses in Africa of all places, and they're they're building resorts and they're uh, they're, they're building little empires all over the place. And you see, uh, we can't necessarily just blame them for being adventurous and us wanting to stay in Australia and play video games, can we? And, and I guess um, part of it is, oh, China's bad. Uh, but uh, when I look at it, it inspires me to see them adventuring into Africa. And this is, a lot of those people will be just the average Chinese person. They're not all Chinese Communist Party people too. So it is a lot more complex than that. And uh, I, you know, a lot of the Chinese people inspire me from day to day when I see, see them adventuring into places that I wouldn't even go on holidays in. They're just dangerous places. And uh, I, was, I was looking at a, uh, a developer that was building a resort in, in uh in, in Africa, and he was saying that you you can't put anything down; it gets stolen, and and he's he has to pay nine thousand dollars just to uh, meet a politician over there, and it, it's inspiring. They're they're adventurers. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, they've they've certainly achieved a lot over the past well thirty years since they started to to open themselves up to the, up to the world and yeah it's certainly not as you said all all sinister uh, a lot of hundreds of millions of chinese have been lifted out of poverty uh during that time and so there is a, a lot to be positive about for the chinese people i'd love to see more australians doing it uh, i would love to see more americans doing it why you know there's a lot of americans that are why about the rise of China 
and then they just stay at home in the United States. There's opportunities all around the world. You know, get out there, fly to one of these countries, check it out, look for an opportunity. We have powerful currency still today. We, we, ha we are highly educated people. There's no reason why we can't get out there and, and hit some of these third world countries and develop something and, and make a lot of money over there the same way the Chinese are doing it. We should be inspired by it. I'm inspired by, uh, in fact, uh, I'm inspired by the Chinese every day when I see them adventuring around the world. And I just think to myself, why aren't more Australians doing it? That underdog spirit, the Anzac spirit, it's non-existent anymore. Uh, not to mention the the wallabies. The, that's another topic. <laughs> now you mentioned that Australia has largely been shielded from Chinese not aggression but uh, strong arming. Um, that's because we've been able to have the United States as a, a phone a friend. But how deep is or committed is? the United States to making sure their influence in the Pacific is maintained? Well, the United States has proven when they, when they dealt with uh, Germany, World War II, when they dealt with the Soviet Union, they do not tolerate peer competitors. And they have their sights. Uh, Barack Obama, he coined the phrase, the pivot to Asia. A lot of people thought, what does he mean, pivot to Asia? What is that? Well, it means that there's a peer competitor in Asia, and that's China. And their sights are fully set on China. Now, Australia is stuck in the middle. Unfortunately, we're stuck in the middle. But uh, we still have that policeman in Asia that keeps us all safe. And uh, if you look at the situation from America's point of view, if... I was in charge. <laughs> I would hate to be in charge, by the way, but all America would have to do really is back off, shrink their military expenditure, move back to just a regional hegemon, just control America, save money, stop fighting battles all around the world, and they would be, they would have that that standard of living that they domestically they want, and they would be able to hold on to it for a lot longer. But that would spell doom for us, and our standard of living would instantly overnight collapse. And uh, China would be doing their best to pin us against uh, uh, New Zealand. They'll be wanting to put military bases in the South Pacific. Uh, imagine if there was a, a base in Papua New Guinea or in uh, in Vanuatu. Uh, we wouldn't. We would want to kick the people, any Vanuatu people in from Vanuatu out of Australia. The, there would be. We, we would have uh, problems with New Zealand. China. It would be in China's best interest to cause chaos down here, and the reason why. How many Australians lay awake at night wondering if New Zealand's going to invade us? They don't. And you think it's because of the you think it's because of the the uh, the Anzacs? It has nothing to do with the Anzacs. It's because we have a maritime power, the United States keeping the peace over here. And a lot of people complain about the United States, but it's been the best thing for our region for a very long time. You see, China's already started to play their card by reducing their uh, uh, the amount of resources they're buying from us and increasing it from Indonesia. You see, all of our resources, all of our trade, we're, we're isolated down here. It all goes through Indonesia. If, say, Indonesia was to choose to blockade Australia overnight, we would become a third world country within months. All of our oil is uh, all of our oil is refined in Singapore. So if Indonesia was to blockade us or some, you know, pirate ships with red flags on it were to start shooting down and commandeering our trade ships, 
we would be in a lot of trouble if, uh, and that would be a real possibility. Don't don't think that it wouldn't happen. It's a real possibility if the United States is pushed out of Asia, uh, and, and is and, and the United States is going to do what's best for the United States always. Uh, Trump is is seen by some as an isolationist when it comes to to foreign policy. I mean, he was elected as America mm-hmm. first, but what's the reality? Has he maintained the the same policy of influence in the Pacific? No, no. Uh, when he left the Trans Pacific Partnership, he just left. Uh, he just left a massive void for China to fill. And now we're doing our best to sign up countries to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But as soon as Trump left that, that is one of the worst, that, that's one of the worst mistakes that Trump made if he wants to remain, have any sort of influence in Asia. And when that happened, a lot of people looked at that as the, the decline of the United States, China, uh, China's rise and uh, the, a lot of countries became very fearful when Donald Trump did that. And, and that, that makes me think that Donald Trump doesn't necessarily have our best interests at heart. That's certainly a drastic change in policy then. Now, the Chinese government, obviously, they, they do their best to control their citizens at home and abroad, but one of the, the greatest challenges and we've seen this recently for for governments in controlling the flow of information is the the internet and a lot of people have talked about the the great uh, firewall of of china where google is heavily censored uh, facebook is is banned a lot of the 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 social media is very controlled their uh, all of their mainstream media is controlled by the state yeah of course the Chinese Communist Party is very insecure, and, and you would be insecure when, uh, when you look at it's such a behemoth of a country. There's like 62, 63 different languages. Uh, not everybody's hand Chinese. You see, there's a, a million uh, in in Xinjiang. There's a million of the Uyghur population in re-education camps right now. They've had their thumb on. You know, everybody knows about Tibet and the Dalai Lama. Uh, they they they're constantly worried about external influences, and the the internet is uh, one of those influences that they don't want getting in. You see, uh, that. The, the whole Tiananmen Square massacre that was uh, that was a protest uh, by pro democracy students in China. They got massacred because of the insecurity of the Chinese Communist Party, and that's why when when I mentioned that the Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party are very different, imagine all the people who have died in China that. Uh, their relatives would love this disgraceful regime to collapse. There's millions of Chinese that want this disgraceful dictatorship with this Emperor Xi Jinping uh, prick to disappear forever because uh, they they do know that it's bad. They know that their friends and family are under a lot of pressure and people are getting locked up, people are being tortured. Uh, people can people say that the, the organ harvesting is not real, but it is real. This Communist Party is very insecure. And uh, if we can somehow convince the Chinese people to overthrow this disgraceful regime, the status quo will be able to remain and we can have our standard of living. But if China keeps rising uh, and Emperor Xi Jinping uh, builds his, uh, he re- rebuilds this uh, one belt, one road to yes. Europe. Yes, can you go into a bit more detail about uh, that um, project? Um, because it's it's another one of uh, China, they have many projects and methods to gain more global 
influence and so that other nations gloss over what you mentioned their their human rights uh, abuses and how uh, how as you mentioned they are very insecure and try to silence critics uh, however they can yeah well they they invested i think it was 30 billion or more but the last year they reduced it down to 1 billion it's it's typical uh, it's typical Chinese negotiation strategy. <laughs> it's uh, try to get you to pay more. So they're trying to sign up countries, but these countries end up uh, paying a lot more uh, than they they sign up for. They think they're going to make a lot of money, then they end up losing a port, <laughs> or they start they 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 lose part of their infrastructure because of the debt trap diplomacy. It, the best way to describe it in simplistic terms is all roads uh, led to Rome. You see, this, this, is, this is the old story of the Roman Empire and the Chinese Communist Party is trying to build and make sure that all roads lead to China. I guess that's the, the best way to look at it, so that all trade leads back to China. China can be the, the biggest economy in the world and the, have the most influence. Uh, if the United States gets pushed out. Australia will have to join the One Belt One Road Initiative. Recently, uh, Italy signed up, which is uh, another example of how China negotiates. They want to, they want to uh, negotiate with you one on one. Yeah, you see, I guess. Yeah, because uh, they signed up the Victorian state government, which was pretty unprecedented that a state government would uh, in, uh, uh, invest in foreign relations. Yeah, it was, I didn't sign them up, it was a memorandum of understanding and I read it, it's very vague and it's it's not really, it, it's only really short, it's like one page and they're signing up, they, they, they're having, everybody, almost everybody has a memorandum of understanding with China now with the One Built One Road, uh, but you see, if it gets to the point where most countries have signed up to it and more benefits it will benefit us more to sign up we might have to uh, but it, if the united states isn't around and they have all the leverage it's not necessarily going to be fair for us we're, we're going to be economic slaves to the chinese communist party so it's a very tough situation we're in and that that leads me back to the trans-pacific partnership and donald trump pulling out of it he he, he royally screwed us uh, by pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It was, it was a really bad decision. Um, and I don't know if uh, his decision to pull out was representative of the entire United States, but it, everybody in the know is very scared when that happened and we are not sure where we stand anymore. Another program that the, the Chinese government has rolled out is what's called the Social credit uh, program. Uh, this was featured on an ABC foreign correspondent where uh, Chinese citizens are rewarded for, for good uh, social behaviors and punished for, for bad ones. It's, it's almost like a, an extreme nanny state uh, program because it, it does involve a lot of uh, big brother uh, uh, technology and analysis to, to work out what how a citizen is going about what most of us would consider their private business yeah so for instance if you buy health food or vegetables you, you get a good score you buy nappies it means you're you're you know you, you you've you're, you're a good citizen if you buy cigarettes or alcohol your credit score will go down uh, one of the extremes would be if you say something bad about the Chinese Communist Party, then you might not be able to, you might be un, become unemployable. You might not be able to rent a place. You might not, in some extreme cases, be able to leave the country ever. Uh, and they've also, they've got these uh, robocops. They're, they're say, <laughs> one and a half metres tall have you heard of them the the robocops they're about one and a half meters tall and they have facial recognition software in them and they go around scanning every face and they they're out uh they're out on the beat in uh in every city in china right now um monitoring where everybody goes and uh it, it, 
they they want to know where everybody is and 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 that's why they're trying to create a, a cashless society uh, they want to know where all the money's going they they've they've in 2016 they put a limit to how much money can can leave the country and at that point that was when we we started to see a lot less chinese investment in australian property and can canadian property as well that was back in 2016 so a lot of people that are looking at the property the day they're like oh it just happened overnight no it started in 2016 uh, and and they're trying to monitor where the money is. They're trying to monitor monitor where the people are. They're trying to monitor uh, what you buy, where you go, what you say, what you do. And, and it all goes back to the insecurity of the Chinese Communist Party. You see, their their legitimacy is their their legitimacy is everything. And and a state survival is the most important thing. It sounds like that. Uh, the way you've described the the, the Chinese government, they, they they almost seem like they need psychological help for their their insecurities and their their overbearing, controlling nature. Yep. Yeah, of course. Well, you see, when the CFO of Huawei uh, was arrested in Canada, and that was that was it's not necessarily reported this way, but that was Canada was getting too close to China. And so I guess the United States had to try to make sure that there was a wedge put between them. As soon as that happened, you could see that I, I predicted instantly the, the childish uh, behavior of the Chinese Communist Party. It's tit for tat. Uh, since then, about 14 Canadians have been arrested uh, for no reason because of revenge, revenge, uh, judicial, uh, just arresting people because they, they want revenge. Uh, it's a very immature leadership in, in China and very predictable. Well, you mentioned uh, Huawei there. They've also been in the news in Australia. They've been wanting to build Australia's 5G network, but because Australia is slowly waking up to the, the influence that, that China wants to have, uh, everyone's now realizing, I don't think that's a good idea. I guess when you look at 5G, we don't necessarily know what 5G is. It's a different type of beast. It's not... It's not just uh, we have 4G, then we have 5G. It's a total different system, and uh, they can gather a lot of data through 5G. But on Huawei, Huawei was always going to take over Apple. Uh, they've got they've got Huawei. They've got Vivo. Uh, Vivo is sponsoring cricket teams in uh, in uh, India and Pakistan, and they're selling phones all over the world, and they're half the price of yeah. an Apple phone. They were always going to win. Uh, I'll be looking to short Apple very very soon. <laughs> Eventually, we'll all if if this is to continue we probably will have no choice but to buy a chinese phone in the next decade because they will be the most advanced phones uh but but on the whole huawei thing you see we've always been choosing our own companies over say better technology we don't always choose the cheapest and best technology and gladys berejiklian when she was the transport minister in new south wales she chose to buy this outdated Opal system. And if you've been to Sydney, there's this Opal card system and it is outdated, it is dodgy, it is slow. Uh, you, you, the, the sensors don't really work. And when that happened, I went to China and I was using their system over there, which would have been a quarter of the price to buy. I can put the card in my wallet and scan it and it will scan through uh, far more advanced than we brought the second hand system, which was the failed system, the Opal system. It was the failed system of the OISA in London. Uh, why? Not because it was the, the cheapest and the best. It was because we're playing the same game. Don't buy Huawei. Don't buy uh, anything that is higher and better and cheaper technology 
uh, we buy from our allies, and that's that's how we've always maintained it. So the, there's also a backstory there as well. You see, yeah, uh, that, uh, that's a, that's an interesting uh, point and a uh, uh, history lesson to to highlight because yeah, there's all these little games going on that vast majority of Australians would have had no idea about so you've certainly given i think all of our viewers and listeners today a lot to to think about uh, uh, and it's certainly been an enlightening uh conversation uh we've had and yeah i'd love to have you back on the show sometime soon if there's any further uh china uh developments because we sort of seem to be on china watch uh now even though you've been on it for for a number of years so so thanks very much for your time today yeah, thanks for having me on, Tim. I totally appreciate it. And that's the show for today. Easter is fast approaching, but the Unshackled will be active over the holiday period, including the release of Further Waves episodes, so stay tuned. We recently hit 5,000 YouTube subscribers, which was a great milestone to reach, and our channel continues to grow. Thank you to all those who regularly watch our content, including this show, and are particularly active in the live chat. We are ending broadcasting waves on Facebook, as it appears that YouTube is where our viewers uh, prefer to watch the show. We are, of course, uh, still on all the other major podcasting platforms. We also have a growing following on free speech social media as part of our aim to diversify our online presence and beat potential censorship. Gab is where we are most active at gab.ai slash the unshackled. We are also at minds.com slash underscore the unshackled. We also have a MeWe page at mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. And we also have our own telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled. Remember, we can't produce all that we do at The Unshackled without the financial support of our followers. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash the unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. Thank you to all those who've signed up and contributed recently. We're going to air on a Wednesday night, so stay tuned for Dear Bell Trans live stream at 8.15 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard time and remember tomorrow night is another episode of our joint show with xyz and the rational rise the uncuckables until then thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time thanks for tuning in to the unshackled waves please visit the unshackled waves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show don't forget to pick up your free ebook at the unshackled battlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.